I'm going to greet you with good morning because it's good morning when I'm recording this. Uh, but uh, hello, hi there, <laughs> uh, greetings. Uh, this morning we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, and if you remember, uh, we've talked about Mark's Gospel before. That because he was writing to uh, Roman uh, believers as opposed to uh, Jewish believers. Uh, his uh, gospel contains very little scripture. It would mean very little, if anything at all, to Roman believers who are not brought up in the Old Testament scriptures. Also, another feature of Mark's gospel is that it's very fast-paced. Um, uh, he uses the words uh, immediately and then, the next day, uh, right after that. Uh, those are the kind of terms that he uses in order to keep the pace moving right along, which was appreciated by his Roman uh, readers. Uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at today is in Mark chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 21 and going all the way through to 43. It's a rather long passage. And when we have a, a long passage, rather than reading it <coughs> in its entirety to begin with, I just ask that if you're not familiar with it, that you uh, pause the uh, lesson here and uh, you read it. So if you'd like to do that, that's fine. Uh, we are going verse by verse and uh, phrase by phrase, so we will be looking at it in detail. But if you're not familiar with Jesus' healing of the woman with the hemorrhage and of Jairus' um, daughter, then uh, perhaps you would like to, to read it for yourself before we begin. Uh, the other thing I'd like to cover this morning, and we did an entire lesson on miracles, uh, but there are a few things that I would like to just go over regarding the miracles of Jesus uh, in particular. And there actually are six, um, six um, uh, um, features of Jesus' healings that have never been duplicated, <clears throat> even by the apostles. The apostles uh, had the power to work miracles. Um, they, as their ministries um, went on, the miracles became fewer and fewer and further and further apart until by the time the apostles were gone from the scene, there were no, um, no more miracles in the same sense that we're talking about the miracles of Jesus. I am of the persuasion that miracles do indeed still happen, but not for the same purpose that they took place at the time of Jesus and the time of the early church. So those are particular features regarding the miracles of Jesus are, first of all, that his healing was direct. Um, he, he performs those miracles with the power of his, his touch or his word. He did not even uh, necessarily need to be in the presence of the person that he was performing the miracle on. They were direct from the power of his word or his touch. Secondly, uh, his healing was instantaneous. There was no, uh, there were no stages of healing. There was no rehab necessary. Um, there was nothing prescribed that the other person had to do in order to be healed. Uh, they were uh, instantaneous. His healings were always complete. Number three, they uh, were never partial healings. When Jesus healed, you were healed. Um, he healed everyone who either came to him or was brought to him or whose, um, whose healing was asked for. Um, he never turned anyone away uh, without uh, healing them if that is what they approached him for. Uh, he healed without discrimination, uh, irregardless of who the person was or what the affliction was. Uh, we never hear Jesus saying, oh, well, I just don't have the power to to heal that particular thing. Um, no, absolutely not. There was never any hesitation to heal for any particular affliction. And uh, he didn't say, well, I don't heal so-and-so or such-and-such or whatever. That would be very un-Jesus-like, wouldn't it? Um, no, he, he healed without discrimination. He healed both um, genetic and organic um, uh, conditions, those that were uh, originated before birth, uh, being genetic, and those that uh, occurred after the person um, after the person was born, which would be organic uh, infections or uh, accidents or for whatever reason the healing was needed, uh, he had no power 
um, uh, healing any of those conditions, no matter how long standing they were and no matter how severe they were. Um, and Jesus brought people back to life. Um, if you think about it, what, what miracle could we imagine that would be more spectacular than bringing a person who had died back to life? Um, even after a disease had run its course and taken the life of its victim, he was not only able to restore that person back to life, but he was able to restore that person back to perfect health. And that's kind of what we'll see today in the miracles that we're going to be, the two miracles that we're going to be examining um, that Jesus performed. Um, the miracles that Jesus uh, performed were um, done in order to authenticate to Israel that he was their Messiah, that he was the Messiah that they were expecting to come. And the, the miracles that the apostles were able to perform were done for the same purpose, uh, to convince people that Jesus was the Messiah that they had expected. Their miracles were performed in Jesus' name. Uh, and also to expedite or to strengthen the establishment of the church, which is what the apostles essentially did, didn't they? They established the early church. So we have today, uh, we don't need miracles to authenticate that Jesus was the uh, promised Messiah, uh, and the church is already established. And we have um, God's word. We have it, um, God's written word. That is what authenticates both his first coming and authenticates the, uh, the validity of the promise of his second coming. We have his written word these days available to anyone. Uh, if I showed you my, my bookshelf over here, I have a whole bookshelf <laughs> full of, of different Bibles, Bibles, uh, um, uh, the same translations, but uh, featuring different, different things, either uh, archaeology or, um, uh, or devotionals or uh, apologetics uh, for any, any number of, of reasons that, uh, that we have uh, a different, different Bibles, including different translations depending on where we're coming from. Uh, different purposes. So the greatest miracle of all, obviously, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, it would be, we would not be able to find another miracle that would be more spectacular than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's detailed in all four Gospels, uh, even John, who sort of filled in the blanks, but uh, he does not ignore that. Well, how could he? It, it's the climax uh, the, the center, the crux of our whole, uh, our whole human history. So it was detailed in all four of the Gospels. It's uh, corroborated by eyewitnesses. Uh, the scripture tells us that um, including 500 people at one time, uh, not just 500 people altogether, but 500 people at one time, the book of Acts um, reassures us. Um, Jesus, uh, through his willing sacrifice, um, he conquered death, uh, not only for himself, but for uh, anyone who would believe in him. Um, that is what the cross accomplished, isn't it? That's what the resurrection, I'm sorry, that's what the resurrection accomplished. There are several previews to his own resurrection recorded in the scripture, one of which we'll be looking at today. <clears throat> I apologize for the coughing, but it's spring. <laughs> what can I say? I think some of you can um, <laughs> can connect with me there. Um, so the previews of Jesus' resurrection, uh, we think of the, uh, the, the, the raising from the dead of the son of the widow of Nain, uh, raised up from his coffin as the, the men are carrying him to his gravesite in, in a coffin. Uh, certainly Lazarus, uh, he had been dead for four days and was already uh, wrapped in his shroud and uh, laying in his tomb. 
Um, and here we have the daughter of the synagogue ruler named Jairus. Um, here, there's something else revealed to us besides God, Jesus, the power of Jesus Christ. We also see his goodness, a tender, tender, compassionate heart of Jesus. And that's kind of what we really want to see today. No one, no one denies um, his power. They didn't then and we shouldn't now. Um, but his power, his, not his power and his goodness and mercy and graciousness are really revealed to us here. So let's turn to Mark chapter 5 and begin in 21. <clears throat> and this is what the scripture, what Mark says. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Um, Jesus um, secluded himself from the crowds on occasion for, for three primary reasons. First of all, just to rest, <laughs> just to rest from the crowds um, for prayer in order to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one time with the Father and um, as a, a focused instruction be, for, uh, for, with his apostles. So those are the three reasons why Jesus would seclude himself from the crowds, either to rest, to pray, or to teach his apostles in a more private setting. Um, other than that, Jesus was uh, accessible to the crowds. And when I say crowds, we'll see as we, we go along here, those crowds were oppressive. They were um, pressing. The crowds were large, and they were pressing against Jesus. It just almost makes me want to have a panic attack, even uh, c considering or even thinking about the crowds pressing against Jesus. Uh, speaking into his face, screaming at him, begging him to uh, pay attention to them and deal with their needs. Um, and Jesus did not separate himself from the crowds except for those, those three reasons that I mentioned. To say that he was hemmed in on all sides with relentless demands would not be an exaggeration. That is the way the scripture uh, presents uh, those crowds to us in its description. So uh, Mark focuses on two particular people in that crowd, and um, they are very uh, different from one another, but they do have one thing in common. So we're going to be talking about uh, a Jairus, and we're going to be talking about the woman with the hemorrhage. Now, Jairus was a man. Obviously, the woman with the hemorrhage was a woman. Uh, Jairus was a wealthy. We'll see that the woman presents herself as poor. Um, he was respected. She was rejected. He was honored. She was ashamed. He was the leader of the synagogue. Remember when we talked about the ruler, uh, that would have been the, the head elder uh, in the synagogue. He would be the one that would manage the, the, the goings on within the synagogue. Um, so he was the leader of the synagogue, and she was excommunicated from the synagogue. She was not allowed to participate in any way, shape, or form in any of the rituals or ceremonies or even attend the uh, synagogue, the Sabbath um, uh, uh, events that were held uh, in the synagogue. Uh, he had a 12-year-old child, a 12-year-old daughter, and she had a 12-year-old uh, malady or affliction. <laughs> she had lived with her malady for 12 years. Not sure that that is terribly um, uh, important, uh, but it is a similarity. It's kind of curious that the, the word, that the, the number 12 is used in both of those cases. Picking up in verse 22. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. So Jairus wakes, makes his way through the crowd, approaches Jesus, and lays down face first on the ground at Jesus' feet. Verse 23, and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he, Jesus, went with him, and a great crowd followed him, 
and thronged about him. Um, as a ruler, he would have been in charge of the synagogue. He had probably, uh, he was probably a Pharisee, though he's not identified as such. Um, he may be, uh, considering where they were, could very well be that he had witnessed Jesus exercise a demon in the synagogue uh, in Capernaum. It could very well be that he was there for that particular event. Uh, he was certainly aware of the miracles that Jesus uh, was performing um, all over the all over the the the, the, the area. Um, <clears throat> with such a crisis in his family, Jairus didn't hesitate to seek help from the one who he felt was more most likely to be able and willing to help him. Uh, those uh, uh, six. Um, uh, features of Jesus miracles would have been identified by this man that he saw that Jesus did not refuse anyone and that he had powers above and beyond what anyone could imagine or explain. Um, from his point of view, his daughter was dying. She was literally on her deathbed. And if anyone could, um, um, restore restore her health and prevent her from dying, then it would be this man, Jesus. How shocked do you think that the Jewish leaders, as well as the disciples are, to see this, this ruler of the local synagogue approach Jesus? Um, it is not something that they have, that they have, that they have seen. And certainly they would have been very surprised. Even the disciples would have been surprised to see him. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at Nicodemus. And we know that Nicodemus approached Jesus. Uh, he was a, uh, a Jewish ruler. Uh, but he approached him under cover of night, not really wanting anyone to know that he was curious enough to approach Jesus. But Jairus pushes his way through the crowds and approaches, not only approaches Jesus directly, not even face to face. He just prostrates, just prostrates himself before Jesus um, at Jesus' feet and begs him to come and heal his, his daughter. <clears throat> um, note that Jesus, what does he do? He responds immediately. He doesn't need to be persuaded. He doesn't uh, need more information as to what exactly her affliction is. Uh, he doesn't ask him to, uh, the father, to, to do anything in particular before he agrees. He doesn't ask for payment um, or favor or anything like that. He just, the, what does the scripture says? And he went with him. And who else went with them? The crowds. They followed Jesus and Jairus. They didn't fall away. They, uh, they followed him, still pressing against him and still making their demands. Verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. <clears throat> she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. I guess she would know the difference, right? After living with this, this disease for 12 years, she would know when the disease had left her body. Let's go back to Jairus for a second. How much, uh, how much of a hurry do you think that he was uh, to get Jesus to his daughter? His daughter was lying on her deathbed. She was this close to dying. He was extremely anxious that Jesus would get there. Um, if you were he, uh, what would you consider to be the, the obstacles <laughs> that you're facing in, in having this girl uh, this girl healed. Uh, certainly the vast number of people surrounding Jesus um, causing congestion. Certainly their, their going was, a, was um, um, slowed down considerably 
because the crowds were going with them. Uh, the demands the people are making of Jesus, certainly he would consider that that would be a distraction for Jesus. It certainly was a distraction for him. Um, Jesus was not easily distracted, but, but Jairus wouldn't know that. And certainly, <laughs> talk about distraction. Here's the woman who stands before Jesus or has approached Jesus, and um, the whole crowd comes to a standstill. It was bad enough that the procession was going at a snail's pace, but now it stops altogether. Um, you can imagine that Jairus would have been extremely frustrated. Uh, he did have faith that Jesus could do what it was that he was asking him to do, but certainly he was um, intent on getting Jesus to his daughter so that he could do what it is that Jairus knew that he could do. A very limited recognition of who Jesus is, uh, and yet the, the, the faith that he had was full-hearted. What do we know about the woman? Let's go back to the woman. She'd been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. We're not told any details. We're not told the, the disease is not called anything. We're not given any other details other than she had been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. Uh, the scripture tells us that she, that she had been to many physicians for a cure. Uh, she had sought anyone who could uh, claim uh, to be able to uh, help her. Uh, you can imagine who some of those people were and what they um, ordered her to do or, or, and what they ordered her to pay them in order for them to cure her, her illness. Uh, she had been to every single one of them. She had wiped out um, her savings. She had no money left, uh, no financial resources left uh, to her to uh, find a cure. And her condition is not only not better, but the scripture tells us that it is actually worse. I think she's desperate. Talk about desperate. We have two desperate people here. Jairus, who is desperate to have his daughter healed, and this woman who is desperate to have her own illness healed. Um, she's, uh, I think it would be fair to say that she's uh, physically exhausted, that she's emotionally drained. Um, she's been socially humiliated. Um, for 12 years, she has been considered to be ceremonially, uh, uh, ceremonially unclean. Um, for 12 years, uh, we know that women uh, needed to be declared unclean uh, um, every month. This woman, month after month after month, she was never declared clean. She was never able to bathe herself for the purposes of being declared clean clean. She had been declared unclean month after month for 12 years. She had been ostracized from the temple and from the synagogue and from any ceremonies and rituals that would have required uh, ceremonial ritual cleanliness. Um, she, I guess we could compare her to the leper, but she wouldn't even probably have been um, uh, welcomed by the lepers because she was would have been considered to be a permanently unclean, uh, this, this poor, poor woman. She approaches uh, Jesus the same way that Jairus does, except she approaches him um, in, in the same way in that she makes her way through the crowd uh, to Jesus. But the difference is that while Jairus is able to, uh, um, to face Jesus, um, she comes up behind Jesus and she reaches out and just touches the tassels on his cloak. Uh, talk about faith. Uh, she knows that even just touching the tassels of the cloak that Jesus is wearing will be enough for his power to uh, cleanse, cleanse her and heal her of her illness. Um, For both of them, it is a last resort, isn't it? Um, here, uh, Mark uses the word immediately, verse 29. And immediately, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. 
As I mentioned before, Mark uses the word immediately often in his storytelling. Here it's used in a little different way because the word immediately, um, while it, use, it is more often used by Mark to describe the, the movement of Jesus and his uh, apostles, here it is used that, uh, in a u- uh, unique way that she is uh, healed immediately. Um, the woman's faith is not superstitious belief. She, um, she, while she believes that touching the tassels of Jesus' cloak uh, will heal her, her faith is in Jesus himself, uh, not in the tassel. It's, it's not as if she says, um, if I could just touch that tassel, that would be, there's enough power in that tassel uh, to heal me. No, she is approaching Jesus in the way that she uh, expects would be, um, she would be able to do. She cannot even imagine that she could wait, make her way to Jesus uh, through the crowd and, and approach him face to face. She has been so humiliated that this is the way that she needs to approach Jesus, a, a recognition of her uncleanliness. Verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Um, It's another rhetorical question. Jesus asks another rhetorical question, uh, not expecting an answer, not expecting an answer that, uh, not expecting an answer because he doesn't know the answer to his question. Uh, Obviously, he knows who it is that's approached him. The reason that he asks the question is so that the woman will reveal herself. Um, Verse 31, (laughs) and the disciples said to him, Jesus, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, an amusing, an amusing uh, uh, comment there by the disciples. In other words, <laughs> look around you. You're surrounded by people all pressed against you, and you're asking us to identify the one person who touched you? Um, uh, it's kind of, kind of amusing, uh, maybe even a little bit sarcastic on the part of the, of the disciples. Um, verse 32, and he, Jesus looked around to see who had done it, but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling and now fell down before him and told him the whole truth. So this is where the disciples, this is where the the Mark, um, who probably got this information from Peter, uh, gets the information regarding the woman's history concerning her, her illness. When the woman confesses to Jesus, her history of uncleanliness. She would have preferred to hide. After all, she was healed, wasn't she? The the scripture tells us before this, the woman knew that her illness was gone. She could have backed out of that crowd the same way that she uh, made her way through the crowd to Jesus. But no, uh, she fesses up, so to speak. Um... The woman who has lived the past 12 years in fear and trembling from her illness, now she approaches Jesus in fear and trembling. And she falls down before the power and and goodness of, of God himself. Verse 34, and Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, Jesus tells the woman that her faith has made her well. And I suppose there would be some who would believe that the power to be healed is in your belief in the power to be healed. And certainly that is not true uh, because many people believe that if you go to a healer or a person who claims to be a healer, that if you believe enough in that particular healer, that you will be healed. And we know that that is just plain not true. Uh, We just hear many, many, many sad stories of people who put their faith in other things or other people uh, to be healed. And um, that is just uh, that is just plain not true. Uh, It could very well be Satan just playing his games. Um, What what he means when he tells her that uh, her faith has made her well, he is speaking of her willingness to put feet 
to uh, what it is that she believes, uh, her willingness to step out and approach Jesus, recognizing that he, he is the one that has the power to uh, help her with her affliction. Um, what's our affliction? Our affliction is our sin. When are we healed of uh, the power of sin? The same way that this woman was healed from the power of her affliction by approaching the one that can uh, save us. Um, this, the comparison is, is undeniable. Um, we, we're not. We're not saved by our actions. It's not our actions that save us. We can't earn salvation. Um, but our, our actions do reveal what is in our heart. And uh, both Jairus and the woman knew that Jesus was their only hope, and they acted on that belief. And that is what Jesus is pointing out here. It's the woman's faith that healed her in the sense that she acted on what it was that she believed, and the power was in what she believed. From the uh, perspective of Jairus, going back to Jairus, I I'm sure he was very happy for this woman. Um, uh, her condition was uh, not life-threatening, as was his daughter's. Uh, you know, he's, he's happy for her, but can we get a move on? We really don't have any indication that that is how Jairus uh, acted or reacted. Uh, but if we put ourselves in his position, um, we need to suspect that those thoughts were going on in his head, if he, even if he didn't voice them. Uh, he might have felt compassion for the needs of the people in the crowds, but his daughter was on her deathbed. It certainly was a, um, a, a matter of urgency here that Jairus was feeling. Um, from human perspective, Time is of the essence, isn't it? We are regulated by time. Um, from God's perspective, uh, time is not of the essence. He is not regulated by time in any way, shape, or form. Uh, he utilizes time uh, to deal with uh, human beings, but he is not regulated by it uh, at all. And so uh, Jesus took the time to heal both the woman's body and her soul. And here we pick up in verse 35. While he was still speaking, that's obviously Jesus, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? We don't know exactly what um, expression uh, this um, this person had on his in his voice or uh, when he uh, he said this word, these words, uh, there's no sense troubling the teacher any further. Were they sarcastic? In other words, uh, if you hadn't stopped here to help this woman, then uh, you know what your your daughter probably would would have been uh, would have been alive. That Jesus would have been able to do his thing for her. Uh, maybe that's what they meant, or maybe they were sincere that because she's dead, there really isn't any reason for you to proceed. We don't know. The scripture doesn't really tell us. Um, but either way, they had a limited understanding of what Jesus was able to do. Um, two people that know Jesus even better, Mary and Martha, didn't they say the same thing when Jesus finally gets there after Lazarus has been dead for four days? What do they say? Um, if you had just been here, Jesus, if you had just been here, then our brother wouldn't have died. Um, again, uh, time to humans is very important. To God, not at all. I was going to say not so much, but it isn't even not so much. It's, it's not at all. 36. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. In other words, stay in the vein in which you approached me, Jairus. Um, Jesus knows what this man is feeling. He, he, he has compassion, not only for the situation, but for his, his feeling uh, for, the, for, for his daughter. 
and it, he encourages him to keep believing. Luke ad, adds the words, these words to Jesus. He says, Jesus said, and she will be made well. Um, this should have been a consolation to this man, to this ruler, that not only should he keep believing, but he should believe Jesus' promise that she indeed will be healed of her affliction. Um, a gracious reassurance on Jesus' part, isn't it? Verse 37, uh, verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So now Jesus does separate himself from the crowds. He leaves the crowds behind. What he did in order to separate himself from them, we don't really know. But he takes Peter and uh, the two uh, brothers, James and John, those three apostles only. He, he even leaves the rest of the apostles behind, doesn't he? Perhaps they were the ones that were containing the crowd. We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us, but that kind of would make sense. So he takes Jairus, obviously, and the three apostles with him. And as they approach the house of the synagogue, the wake is in full blast. And when we talk about Jewish wakes, we are talking about a lot of commotion. Um, people are uh, tearing their clothes. There was a whole list of how people should act at a wake for a, a, a beloved, uh, a, a dead beloved one. Um, uh, how their clothes should be torn. Um, but it was a, um, a, pr a prescribed, a prescribed way. There were uh, professional mourners that were hired to vocalize feelings of sadness. And when I tell you that they were extremely loud, that they consisted of howling and groaning, uh, that would have been um, awakes. When, when we go to awake, it's very quiet and subdued, isn't it? Not, not the Jewish wake, at least at the time of Jesus. They would have hired uh, musicians, uh, particularly flute players, that would play um, uh, loud, uh, dissonant sounds to symbolize a pain and suffering, um, uh, off key, off key notes that would be played, uh, jarring to the nerves, just uh, more uh, disturbing uh, that would contribute to this, this time of mourning. Uh, the scene was loud and chaotic and depressing. Verse 39, and when Jesus had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion? and weeping. The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside. This term sleeping that Jesus uses, he, he also used it in reference to Lazarus uh, when, the, uh, when the disciples came to him uh, and informed him that, Jesus, that, that Lazarus was sick unto death. And Jesus says, uh, he is sleeping. And the apostles say, well, if he's sleeping, then he'll wake up. And Jesus says, no, he's dead. Uh, but from, from Jesus' point of view, from God's point of view, those that we would consider to be dead are asleep. It is a temporary state. When we say someone is dead, we are putting a permanent connotation on that word. But to Jesus, to God, Sleeping, uh, um, death is a temporary, a temporary state, and so the uh, chaos is replaced with silence because he puts them all outside. He sends the musicians home. He sends the professional mourners home, and he tells everyone else just to quiet, to be, to be quiet. Uh, picking up at the um, in verse forty again. And he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, which would have been the three apostles, and he went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. It actually means little lamb, little girl, little lamb, precious one, 
uh, however it is that we want to, uh, it can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Um, and immediately, ah, here we have that word again with Mark. Immediately the girl got up and began walking. Well, she was 12 years of age. Uh, and they were immediately, again, overcome with amazement. Just make one comment here, the age of the girl. In this culture, a 12-year-old girl um, could have been promised to, uh, for marriage. She could have become engaged to someone for marriage. She was actually considered to be a woman, um, which is probably why uh, Mark mentions that she was um, uh, 12 years of age. Uh, other than that, we may think that when the girl got up and began walking, that she was just a little child. No, she was a 12-year-old girl, essentially considered to be an adult by this, uh, this culture. Uh, and yet to her daddy, <laughs> to her daddy, she was his little girl. Um, and so immediately the girl gets up and she begins walking, which evidently is amazing because not only was she on her deathbed, but evidently she had been ill for a good period of time and totally unable to walk. So the fact that she's up and walking is amazing. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. They were, again, astonished. They marveled at such a miracle that not only should she not be dead but alive, but that she should be able to walk, that she should be able to function that she would be restored to perfect health. Um, Jairus had been extraordinarily kind. I'm sorry, Jesus had been extraordinarily kind to Jairus. Let's just uh, kind of go back through that story and see how Jesus' kindness and goodness is woven through it. First of all, he gave him a personal audience in the midst of a crushing crowd. He cleared away the crowd from in front of him and recognized the man who was laying at his feet in worship. He allowed him to stand up and to um, address him face to face, a gracious, a gracious Jesus. He agreed to go to his house. Could he have healed this, this girl without going to his house? He certainly could have. He has in the past, didn't he? The centurion slave, he just spoke the words and the, the, the centurion slave was healed. <clears throat> he certainly could have done that. Not only did he assure um, uh, Jairus that his daughter would be uh, uh, um, brought to life, but that she would be healed. She will be made well, uh, he tells her, he tells him. He takes charge of the chaotic situation at Jairus' house, doesn't he? He doesn't wait for, for Jairus to deal with it. He doesn't instruct anyone else to get rid of these people or whatever. He takes charge of it right then and there and clears the house of all the mourners and the music, uh, mus musicians. Uh, he leads Jairus and his wife to the room where the daughter, uh, where the daughter, uh, where the daughter's body is, and he lovingly touches and raises the girl to life and restores her to health. Um, what a, um, a sweet Jesus we see here. What a loving, compassionate, feeling, um, emotional Jesus we see here, that he would do this for this man and his wife and his daughter, their family. Um, the reaction of the girl's parents <laughs> as well as the apostles, is an amazement, bewilderment. They, they're just astounded. Verse 43. And he strictly charged them to tell no one. Uh, he, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Um, he, he says to them, uh, let's not tell anyone the details of all this. And uh, maybe you should give her something to eat. Um, she may be restored, but she still needs her food. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? Uh, we see the tenderness of Jesus. It's the same tenderness that he uses when we approach him 
um, afflicted with our illness, our sin that has such power over us. And he touches us and tells us to rise up and to continue on with our lives. Uh, and he will be with us by our side. Beautiful, beautiful story. And um, I just uh, pray that uh, you will go back and uh, read it again and hopefully glean some things out of it that perhaps you have never seen before. The Bible is alive. It's God's living word. Uh, it's his gift to us. And uh, we just are so thankful for it. Let's utilize it. Yeah, let's utilize it. Amen.